model, although that's going to be a challenge, but we'll see what we can do. Um, and I want to first just start with a qualification. I'm not an art historian. I'm a music historian. So I'm not going to be like dissecting the fine aesthetic points of the posters that we look at. I'm going to be trying to more put them in the context of when and where they were made. And so we'll start by talking a little bit about the San Francisco scene in the 60s. We'll move on to talking a little bit about the artists. And then we'll take as much time as we see fit to check out some of their work around the room. Uh, and if you've got any questions, feel free to pipe up. Uh, certainly try to leave some time for questions at the end. And I'll hang around if you want to just come up and say, hey, after we're done here. Um, I'm starting here because this is actually, I think, a really good way to get situated. This is a map of San Francisco, or at least a part of it, with some of the main music venues in the city circa the mid to late 60s. Um, you know, one really crucial thing to know about most of the work in this exhibit is that these were posters that were made to advertise concerts. And that's absolutely the starting point for me for trying to figure out why they matter. Um, and one of the things to put away in that regard is just a really basic thing that these were, these were advertisements, right? Like as great as many of them are as pieces of visual art, they were made to advertise gigs. And I think that in and of itself tells us something pretty <laughs> crucial about the ways in which creativity and commerce blended together in the context of the late 60s. Um, San Francisco was a crucial meeting ground for those forces. Uh, it was the city above all that really gave rise to a music scene that I think mattered as a scene. You know, when we use the word scene, sometimes it's used pretty loosely, but I think it usually means like it's a place that's not just like you can go see a show every once in a while, but it's like there's stuff happening. And not only is there stuff happening, but it's like there's there are things in place that help people know what's happening, and that make people feel like when they're going to a show, they're part of something that isn't just an isolated event, right? That's a scene. And San Francisco had that going by virtue of having some of the best and pione most pioneering music venues in the US. The two key ones uh, most of these posters were made in connection with were the Fillmore and the Avalon, right? A lot of you, I'm sure, know as, almost as much about this, if not more than I do. Um, <laughs> I'll exercise a little humility on this. <laughs> but they were, they were really pivotal spaces for the presentation of live music. Prior to this point in the history of live music, especially rock, um, you know, if you went to a rock and roll show in the 50s, like the kind of shows that Alan Freed put together, you were likely to see maybe a dozen artists on the bill. Each one would maybe play two or three songs. The whole night would be long. I mean, it would sometimes be three hour, four hour show, but no artist played for more than 15 or 20 minutes. It was sort of like a live version of Top 40 Radio. Um, <laughs> things started to really change in the context of the San Francisco live music scene. You know, one band was expected to play for an hour, an hour and a half. In the case of the dead, maybe three hours, four <laughs> hours, a whole evening into the next morning. <laughs> you know, about the length of an acid trip. <laughs> now, it was a scene with a lot of unity, and at the same time, it wasn't a scene that was entirely unified. And even just these two primary clubs, the Fillmore and the Avalon, tell us something about some of the uneasiness in the scene, as well as some of the things that bound people together. Bill Graham, who founded and ran the Fillmore, and Chet Helms and his family dog organization, who founded and ran the Avalon, were very different in the way that they thought about the social and economic role of live music. Bill Graham was an unashamed, unapologetic capitalist. And he knew that there was an economic opportunity in the counterculture that was almost unprecedented to make money out of putting music in front of people. Um, he also was sensitive to the cultural currents at the time enough to know that as much as he could go after the money, he needed to also speak to his audience in its own language. And he was very good at striking a balance between those things. But in doing so, he still, at the end of the day, was a money man first and a money man last. And he was 
not at all shy about competing with people who were in competition with him and trying to put them out of business. Um, so for instance, at the very beginning of the film war, he was supposedly in a kind of partnership with Chet Helms, who wound up being the main guy behind the Avalon. But he basically stole the Avalon out from Chet Helms and blocked Helms out of the deal. And it was only at that point that Helms and the family dog started their own space, which became the Avalon Ballroom. Um, and Helms never forgave Graham, and they always had a grudge against each other. But in some ways, it was precisely that tension that really, I think, made the scene as great as it was, because it motivated each of these guys to sort of one-up the other in terms of the quality of the shows that they were working on. Um, by ni early, early mid-66, both of these clubs were up and running. And so it's really 66, 67 that the scene starts to full on take hold. Um, most of this material in here, at least the stuff we're going to focus on, is from those two years, 66, 67. Um, and it, I think that's a really cool thing to know about this exhibit, is how specific it is in a very particular moment in time and place in time. Um, I just want to point to a couple things that are sort of in proximity. So. We won't go look at them, but you should know that they're here. Um, over on that wall right there, right, uh, is a, is a, sorry, I'm pointing. Bad etiquette. Yeah, it's right, I'll, I'll walk over here, but you don't have to follow me. Right here um, is a poster for something called the Magic Mountain Music Festival. This was in June of 1967, and it pre preceded the more well-known Monterey Pop Festival by like a week or two. And so it was really the first full-on rock festival of the late 60s era that we associate as the era of the rock festival. Uh, but it was, not, it was not covered in the same way as Monterey Pop. It's not usually seen as having had the same kind of impact. But it kind of set the tone. It was up on top of a tall mountain, and people had to actually ride a bus up to get to it. Uh, and so it was kind of purposefully isolated. Uh, so, you know, you felt like you were in this very special place when you went to this festival. Uh, as opposed to some, Woodstock had some of the same quality, but of course, on a whole other scale. But the kind of rural idol quality of festivals really starts with this. You know, that going to a festival means not being in a club, not being in the city, but going somewhere outside. Okay. <laughs> Over there. <laughs> this is a pretty crucial poster. Um, January of 67, so this is a few months before what we were just looking at. Uh, the Human Being. This was really like the thing that kicked off 1967 as the year when the counterculture in San Francisco was going to hit its full force. Um, it was not a music festival. It was a it was a psychedelic culture festival, right? The, the guy who's named at the top here is Timothy Leary. <laughs> and there's Allen Ginsberg. And there's Richard Alpert, uh, who later, of course, became oh. Ram Dass. And <laughs> for, yeah, exactly, right, you know. Uh, you know, and then it says, oh yeah, and some rock bands. You know, like the Grateful Dead and them. Ah, yeah, they're just the side attraction, right? Um, this poster was made by one of the five artists who were really central to the San Francisco poster art scene, Rick Griffin. Uh, his work is actually probably the least well represented of the main five artists in this exhibit. But he was a really crucial figure. He had a very distinct style. Um, one thing that's prominent here that is a theme that runs through a lot of the art in here in an odd way uh, is you've got a Native American guy with an electric guitar riding a horse. And Native American imagery was very commonplace. And you can read it a few different ways. Um, I mean, there's a kind of racial exoticism happening that is unquestionable. But there was also an effort to tap into what was perceived as a kind of tribalism. You know, like we're all part of one tribe, one big tribe. And there was a kind of romanticization of Native American values around the notion that we live off the land, that we live in a place that has community. And so the, the Native American figure became a figure that stood in for many of the participants in the counterculture in this place and time. 
And you know, we can look at it now and critique it, but it was, it was representative of some pretty deeply held values. At the same time, you've got him with an electric guitar, and that shows, again, these sort of contradictions. It's pastoral, but it's also technology. And that was another one of those boundaries that folks in the counterculture were always keeping in front of them and trying to resolve. Um, so Griffin was one of the primary artists. The others I'm going to sort of name off quickly. Their work is scattered around the exhibit space. Wes Wilson was really probably the founder of the rock poster as commercial art form where San Francisco was concerned. He started working for the family dog. He moved into working uh, for Graham's Fillmore as well. Eventually he became more associated with the Fillmore. He ran a letterpress company along with another guy and that was how he got into making posters. So he wasn't like a trained artist, he was a printer really. Uh, but his artistry, so to speak, evolved as he kept getting hired to make posters. So by the time you get to some of his work on the opposite wall, it gets to be pretty refined and pretty elaborate. Victor Moscoso, native of Spain, was the most formally trained artist of the group of five who were the primary artists. Um, definitely had a very distinct visual style of his own that was much more florid and definitely had the sort of psychedelic quality of like bright colors that seem like they're kind of floating in front of your eyes and you're not sure if you're focused and it's trippy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, right there. <laughs> um, Alton Kelly was in many ways probably the most broadly influential of the artists, not just as an artist, but also as somebody who was tapped into the larger countercultural scene. He was actually one of the founding members of the Family Dog. So he had a lot to do with getting the Avalon Ballroom off the ground and of some of the shows that preceded it that were really crucial. Um, there was a group of folks who went off to Nevada for a while and were staging shows in this like frontier saloon they would all wear Western gear, and they would hang out and drink, and they would listen to the music and get high. And the band of that scene was the Charlatans, who was a band that isn't so well remembered from the San Francisco scene at this time, but were really crucial in a pivotal, mo pivotal moment. And Kelly was very tied in with that. He often collaborated with Stanley Mouse, and the two of them, among other things, are responsible for creating a lot of the most well-known imagery associated with the Grateful Dead. And then we have Griffin. So those are the big five. They're all guys, right? Uh, they're all white. And because this is Smith, we pay attention to these things at least a little bit. Um, <laughs> if you walk around the room here, you'll notice there are only two women whose names you'll see as artists among the posters. Uh, Roberta Bell, whose work is in that black light room, and I don't know much about her. I tried finding some stuff out, I couldn't find much out. Bonnie McLean, some of whose work is on the opposite wall. Actually, I think right directly in front of me over there. Um, who's notable, among other things, for having been married to Bill Graham for quite a long time. Uh, and I think it says something that the primary female poster artist of this scene was married to the, the primary concert promoter. That's not to say that she didn't get by on her talent, too, because she did. She was every bit as skilled and talented as any of the male artists. But she wasn't part of their scene. She wasn't part of their community. The five male artists who were the primary movers in the poster art scene really bonded together. And one example of that takes us over to the other side of the room. We're going to skip aesthetics they don't really matter. <laughs> uh, this poster right here, which I know it's in an awkward place for people to see, so I'll just point it out and you can look at it on your own as you see fit. The joint show, right? And you look at it and you think, oh, that's just a funny drug reference, ha ha. But this was actually a really key sh show in 1967 where all of these five artists I just was talking about pooled their resources and exhibited their work together. And it really represented the moment when the posters of the San Francisco scene got recognized as being works of art in their own right. Um, you know, it was also a funny double entendre. But that doesn't hurt. Um, so when we turn the corner over here, this is where we really get into the heart of it. And 
the, the exhibit's laid out very conveniently insofar as what we have are most of the walls are organized in a way so that artists are more or less isolated in the work they did, but also associated with the clubs that they were doing the work for. So this wall, most of the posters on this wall were done for a club called The Matrix, which actually preceded both the Fillmore and the Avalon. It was founded in 1965. <laughs> Um, one of the founding figures in the Matrix and an investor in it early on was Marty Balin, who was the singer for the Jefferson Airplane. And the Jefferson Airplane, who was one of probably the three or four most significant representative bands of the scene, was basically the house band at the Matrix when it was founded in 1965. And hey, why not? Balin owned the place, so you got a gig whenever you want it. Um, these are all posters by Victor Miscoso. So you really get a good chance to see, like this is his visual stuff. Very bright colors, um, imagery that sometimes verges on the classical, and other times, so it's almost more like pop art. Um, now we have to talk a little about some of the bands. We're not gonna have time to get into anywhere near as much of what's interesting here as we might, because there's only so much time. But I wanna point out a couple of key things here. The very first poster we see here by Moscoso uh, for a Matrix show, this is from early in 1966, is for Junior Wells. Junior Wells was not a San Francisco psychedelic rock artist. Junior Wells was one of the great Chicago blues harmonica players. And this tells us something important about the scene and the live music scene in San Francisco in this time period. That there was a real effort made by all the people booking shows at these clubs to take the local bands and the local style and the psychedelic scene and mix it up with other influences that were coming from outside in ways that showcased a certain set of values. Um, and so putting like a figurehead of the blues scene in with psychedelic venues and psychedelic music was kind of saying like, we care about this stuff. We're, we're, we come from this stuff on some level. And you, you'll notice there's quite a lot of it around the room. I mean, if you, when you take the chance to see the whole exhibit. Junior Wells is actually represented more than once around here. Chuck Berry comes up several times. Um, and it's really important to see that that was a part of the scene because there is a point at which white rock and black soul and blues and R&B kind of took their separate paths. But at this really pivotal moment, there was this effort to put them in the same place at the same time. <clears throat> Over here we've got the doors. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and the only thing I'll say here, I mean, it's the doors, right? <laughs> but they were from L.A. They weren't in San Francisco. Exactly, right? So here we see another side of how the scene, as it was taking shape in San Francisco, was not all of a piece. That just as there was this effort to extend the influence across racial lines and musical lines, there was also this Southern Cal, Northern Cal thing that was pretty significant. The Doors were among a, a few really crucial LA bands who made their way up to San Francisco routinely. Um, others included The Birds, a poster for whom you can see right here, one of the best posters I think in the whole exhibit, one where you really see the kind of aestheticism at work, along with an effort to take a band name and do something really unusual and creative with it. You know, and the birds themselves were absolutely crucial to the musical developments that happened in the 60s. I mean, building on Bob Dylan's music, they effectively founded folk rock as a meaningful cultural form, right? Um, really briefly, this is a little awkward because I'm off in the corner here. I'm going to move really quickly. But I just want to point this out because this is a really interesting and revealing piece. Um, poster for a benefit for the San Francisco Mime Troupe. The San Francisco Mime Troupe was a theatrical troupe based in San Francisco that predated most of the musical things that the scene revolved around. Bill Graham got his start in cultural production, shall we say, promoting, or not promoting, but like helping to further the interests of the San Francisco Mime Troupe. And the first things he ever actually promoted as a concert promoter were benefits for this troupe. This is already like 67, which is well into his concert promoting career. So this is a sort of latter day benefit. But it shows you how the rock scene was tied in with these broader developments that were very locally rooted in San Francisco, right? And the heading on this poster, Busted, 
refers to the fact that the mime troupe needed to have a benefit held for them because they got busted, they got arrested for performing without a license in a San Francisco public space, <coughs> which happened off. Almost all of the posters on this part of the exhibit are by Wes Wilson, who, as I mentioned a few moments ago, was really the sort of founder of the poster art scene in San Francisco. Um, on some level, one might say his work isn't quite as visually distinctive and arresting as Moscoso, um, but it has its own distinctiveness to it, and he was groundbreaking, and that matters a lot. Um, I mean, there's just so much good music here, there's not even time to point it out. I mean, you look at a poster like this, Chuck Berry and Eric Burden with the animals, right? The Steve Miller blues band, who was opening for them all, right? Because Steve Miller was like this up-and-coming blues rock artist in San Francisco in 66, 67, who of course would go on to have the biggest top 40 radio hits of the mid-70s, but at this time he was an aspirant, right? The Grateful Dead, Junior Wells, again, and The Doors. I mean, that's just <laughs> insane, <laughs> right? But this, is, this represents what I was talking about a moment ago, that effort to put together bills that were eclectic, that represented different sides of what was happening, right? So you've got more straight up blues, you've got San Francisco psychedelic rock, and you've got the LA version of the same, which was really different. I mean, The Doors sound nothing like The Dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and then tying it together, you've got this crazy, wonderful lettering and this creepy face, you know? And, and what all of these elements show is how the aesthetic around this was one that was in some level meant to unsettle you. Um, I think we often too easily assume that psychedelia meant peace and love and everything was happy, but you look at a lot of these and they're not all that peaceful or loving. They're kind of weird and a little bit disturbing. And I think that's very representative. I mean, if you've ever really listened to a dead set all the way through, you know, there's stuff where you feel the goodness of everything coming together, but there are a lot of places where things feel like they're going to fall apart at any moment. And that's part of <laughs> the brilliance of the band is that they're able to take you from one place to the other. That was psychedelia. And, um, and way back then, they weren't what, the, what people think of them now, that right. they were not. I mean, this is them in their crystal stage, right? Yeah, they're they were, really they were not that big of a deal way back then, Absolutely. outside of San Francisco. Right, right. I mean, they, I think, maybe had signed their record deal by this point, but only there. Actually, no, they wouldn't, because they didn't sign their record deal until after Monterey Pop. Uh, so this is a pretty telling piece again. This, is, was, this was the last poster that Wes Wilson did for Bill Graham's film. Um, well, Wilson had eventually like just gone to exclusively with the Fillmore and his loyalty seemed to be with Graham, but Graham, again, he was always in it for the buck. He decided he didn't want to keep paying Wilson what Wilson wanted to be paid. So Wilson was like basically dismissed. Uh, for making contract demands that Graham didn't want to live up to. Now, you know, it's another crazy, great show with the dead headlining. Um, it's really hard to read, actually, some of the other bands that are on there. Um, but what's, what's most revealing here is not the naked female body, although that stands out too. But it's kind of hard to see if you're not right up close. There's a snake at the bottom. Guess who that snake is supposed to represent? Graham. With a dollar sign in his mouth. <laughs> there are ways to get hidden messages into these things. So Graham didn't notice that, huh? Oh, he might have. But Graham was, for all his ego, a somewhat open-minded man. Uh, I mean, he was married to an artist after all. Uh, whose work is right there. That was a good segue, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is, these are two works by Bonnie McLean. Uh, so really, again, the most prominent female artist who was associated with the poster art scene. Um, very much in keeping, I think, with the style we see through the other work of the other artists. She was also more well-trained formally than many of her male counterparts. Uh, probably most comparable to Moscoso in this regard. 
Um, and again, she was married to Graham, and she wasn't just making posters for the Fillmore, she was doing office work for the Fillmore. She was making sure that everything ran on time. I mean, she was definitely like part of the business. Um, and he didn't treat her very well, surprise, surprise. They eventually split, but they did have a child together, and, and she was a very, very plugged in part of the scene. Uh, and these are, again, two great representative works. One, we've got Big Brother and The Holding Company, right? Another one of those absolutely pivotal and central San Francisco bands. That was Janis Joplin's group, right? Steve Miller, again, dude gets around. Uh, down at the bottom, We've got the Electric Flag and Moby Grape, and again, Steve Miller, my God. Um, yeah, so maybe some of these names don't resonate, and that's part of why this exhibit and why this stuff matters is because looking at these posters and attending to who's being promoted, we see that, you know, anyone who knows anything about the San Francisco scene in this time period knows the dead, knows the airplane, knows Big Brother. But do you know Moby Grape? Yes. Many of you do. <laughs> I bet a lot of you don't. And if you don't, you should, because the one album that they made that was just called Moby Grape is one of the best albums of the era. Um, there are a lot of bands like that whose work is represented on these posters. A great example is actually right here. Uh, the 13th Floor Elevators. This is one of my favorite posters in this whole exhibit. I mean, first of all, again, it's weird. It's <laughs> creepy. Um, you know, the, the little placard beside it tells us that the image is actually taken from a Life magazine cover. But even knowing that or not, it's, it's disturbing in a certain sense. And that's sort of appropriate because of the bands who were represented in here, you know, the Doors had their own weird psychic energy, right? Sometimes they could tr transmit some bad vibes. The 13th floor elevators were like a whole different kind of psychedelia from what you would get from a band like The Dead. They were more of the sort of what we would today refer to as garage rock, right? This was like slamming heavy three chord proto-punk rock that also happened to have some instrumental freak out parts that made people hear it as psychedelic. Uh, and this was, a, this was a crucial strain of mid 60s rock it was a sort of more underground strain in a lot of ways. And these guys weren't from San Francisco, they were from Texas. Um, I'm sure many of you know the story, but I'm sure many of you don't. The singer for the 13th Floor Elevators, Rocky Erickson, is one of the great tragic drug casualty stories of the 60s. Um, he, I mean, he, he did loads and loads of LSD, which in and of itself doesn't necessarily destroy you. But he also, I think, had other mental issues in which eventually led to his being institutionalized, in which context he was given electroshock therapy, in which context he basically lost his mind. Um, he did not stop making music, though. And some of his most riveting and powerful music came many, many years after the 13th Floor Elevators had disintegrated under his own name. He uh, released songs with titles like Two-Headed Dog. And the general take on this material is that Rocky Erickson sang about these things that were supernatural, but when you heard him singing about it, you believed he actually thought it was real. But meanwhile, it's just great rock and roll. And it just happens to be about a two-headed dog. Uh, so if you're ever curious, check out some Rocky Erickson. And if you're ever curious, go back and check out some 13th Floor Elevators, because it's really some of the best music of its kind from this era. Now as we move here, we're also moving into the Avalon. Fillmore is over there, Avalon's over here. right? So we're now in family dog country. And there's some other details here that I think are worth checking out. I mean, A, you know, who's the supporting band for the 13th Floor Elevators? Quicksilver Messenger Service, right? Another really significant San Francisco local psychedelic band that became quite something of, over time. But we also get the Family Dog logo, which is worth checking out on its own. It's tiny, so it's hard to see unless you're right up again. Um, but this thing in the middle here is another Indian guy, right? So I pointed out over with the BN how Native American images keep popping up through the counterculture. 
as something that people affiliate with. Well, the family dog chose an Indian man as its symbol, right? Because again, what they were trying to promote was this sense of tribalism as a basis of community. And that's what that was meant to represent. Can I ask you, it says ticket outlets. Do you know anything about it? I mean, that's kind of a, a new thing too, isn't it, right? Well, it is, it is becoming a new thing. And what I, it's great that you point that out. Um, you know, so as a historian of rock, I wasn't sure if I was going to get into this level of detail, but it's, it's great detail. You know, if you really read these things closely, what you learn is not just who's playing where, but also you get a little microcosm of the scene beyond the club, right? So ticket outlets tend to be places that are really key institutions within the larger scene and community. And I need my glasses to read them. <laughs> um, but you've got the psychedelic shop, which was probably the first of its kind on the Hague. City Lights Books, right, which is a holdover from the 50s beat era, but still going super strong. Um, Cedar Alley Coffee House, Discount Records, and a place called Sandal Maker. <laughs> and a couple other it's things that are pretty <laughs> obscure. Uh, bookshop. Record City, Kepler's Bookstore. So this, this gives you a kind of little map of the scene. You know, this is, this is a community in microcosm that you find. Like, is there a price? Uh, no, there is no price. I think the general price would have been about a buck, buck fifty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, things have changed. Yeah. So, we're probably coming up on where are we at? All right, let's, let's give a few more a close look. Um, as we move into the Avalon, we move into a realm of different artists and different work. So here we have Victor Moscoso again, right? He started working for the Matrix, but he moves over to the Avalon because the Avalon becomes the bigger player over time. Uh, and then below him is a poster by Rick Griffin again. Right? So I said Griffin's work, relatively speaking, isn't as plentiful around the room, but this is a good piece. And these guys often collaborated. I think the place where they met, they were really quite different stylistically. Um, you know, Moscoso liked swirly things and really bright colors. Griffin's style was a little bit more well-honed and finely detailed. Um, but they both did comic book art along with doing poster art. Uh, they both worked for the groundbreaking underground comic series Zap Comics, and I think that was where they formed their collaboration. Uh, these are not pieces that they collaborated on, but there are some pieces along the wall here where they do, so you can check some of those out. And this is, this is the family dog guy, right? There's that Indian head again, but this time he's being used as more of a full-on logo, but of course with some modifications. <laughs> This, I just think, is one of the most visually striking. This is Moscoso again. I mean, this is really, I think, well-realized psychedelic art at its heyday. The lettering becomes like a puzzle, right? I mean, it's not meant to be easily deciphered. And that is just absolutely the defining characteristic of the aesthetic of this scene. Um, I also pause over this one because uh, again, the bands are worth pausing over. Well, and particularly the guy at the top, or the band at the top is not the guy, but Blue Cheer. Mm. You know, this is another one of those band names that if you know who the band is, it tells you that this was a scene that had some real diversity within it. Not necessarily, you know, gender and racial diversity, but sound diversity. Uh, Blue Cheer was basically proto-metal. Right? They were the loudest band on the scene. They played sludge rock. Um, their best known song is probably their cover of Summertime Blues. And if you've heard it, you know, like they really pioneered a level of just full on crazy guitar distortion like nobody had ever messed with outside of someone like Jimi Hendrix. And Hendrix was already current by this time. Um, but they didn't have the virtuosity of Hendrix, right? And so this is another dividing line. Like when we talk about punk rock, for instance, you know, what makes punk rock different from anything else? Well, a lot of it has to do with a kind of cultivated sloppiness, um, which is used to creative advantage. You know, who needs more than three chords and a good bit of noise, right? So 13th floor elevators were one version of that. 
Blue Cheer is like the version of that that kind of morphs into heavy metal. Um, most metal bands ultimately wound up being more refined and virtuosic in their approach, even though they were also very noisy. Uh, so in that regard, Blue Cheer was proto, right? They weren't full-on metal. They were proto-metal. Now, I just actually noticed this. The other, one of the other performers on this bill, this is another good indication of just how weird these bills are, uh, is Clifton Chenier. <laughs> Some of you know who that is. This is like a pioneering figure in Cajun Zydeco music. Creole Zydeco. Yeah, not Cajun, Creole. African American, Louisiana guy, played an accordion and played some of the greatest Cajun music ever, ever made. What's he doing on a bill with blue cheer? That is just weird. Right? But we see a theme, right? I mean, I established it straight up, and we just keep seeing these examples of it, that there was a certain fundamental eclecticism at work in this <coughs> in scene and in this aesthetic that were, that were definitive. It wasn't accidental. It wasn't just like somebody booking these shows didn't realize that there were two things going on that didn't belong together. They wanted to put things together that were gonna be kind of dissonant because that made things more interesting. Who else is on there? Lee Michaels. Yeah. Uh, I think that's actually it. And then it says North American. Oh wait, North American boy. I'm <laughs> even with my glasses on. I'm like, what? <laughs> Something. And then this just says San Francisco. So I think these are just like North American, San Francisco. So it's really, I think it's the three groups. Blue Cheer, Lee Michaels, Clifton Chenier. Question. Yeah. It seems like all these posters, it's typically posters, you know, you can see and view and read from a distance. Yeah. All of these are very detailed. You're meant to go up and look at them close. Yeah. Was that conscious? Well, I think it was a strategy. Style. Well, it was, I think it was deliberate. I, I think there was definitely, by the artist, an effort to try to make these into things that you had to work to see from, right? It was like, if I'm gonna make an ad, I'm gonna make it an ad that has to be decipherable, that isn't gonna just speak for itself. Um, and I think the, the club owners were okay with that because the audiences were coming, you know? Um, and because advertising themselves in this way allowed them to kind of have their cake and eat it too, right? If you put out this sort of thing as an ad, you're kind of saying, come one, come all, and check out the great stuff that I'm putting out and pay me your dollar. But you're also saying, you're gonna see something here that's not like any other commercial production you're gonna go to. So they were able to like commercialize their product, but also maintain this kind of distinct aura around it that I think the posters really played into. Well, but they were also saying that the scene was more important than the artist. Totally. Right. You know, that's a great that's point. That's what the poster, that the poster shouts at. Also, yeah. I, and I, I don't have direct experience with this, but I understand how to do the LSD experience. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Somebody said they didn't inhale at one point. Yeah. <laughs> well, the beauty about LSD is you didn't have to. I don't to. think you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> the was a small minority of people that were into this. It wasn't like a mainstream thing at all. So you were speaking for almost like a select group of people that would want to what it says. You were, but I think that that, you know, again, one of those places where the counterculture reaches that tipping point of a contradiction is that it keeps growing, yeah. right? And at a certain point, it's almost like you don't even have to worry about who the bands are because someone's going to go to the Fillmore because it's the Fillmore. But, uh, and by the time you get to 67, 68, that's already pretty well in place. I mean, I know that it also started conversations. Sure. I mean, because certainly teenagers were like, man, are you going to that show? Because you, some people would see it and they're like, what? Yeah. Is this set? You know, and then people were like, oh, yeah, well, it says, you know. And then it would just cause, create interest because it would create conversation. It would, but I mean, the other thing is that these serve multiple functions. So, yeah. you know, they publicized events ahead of time, but they were also given out to people at the shows. I mean, Bill Graham treated these like party favors, mm -hmm. and so did the guys at the Avalon. Your, your hand goes well as well as right. Uh, and I think there is, uh, on one of the blurbs around here, it also talks about the fact that these were these were put up and the artists were also striving to have people look at them for a while. Absolutely. They were they, they already considered the works of art. 
Right. Whereas, you know, the mainstream might not have. Right. So there were a lot of factors at work that made the artists want to make these things into something that wasn't readily legible and that made the people running the clubs okay with that. Um, because there was a larger scene where these were being read through a context where if you couldn't make out the band names, you still more or less knew what you were going to get. And you knew you were going to like it if you were plugged in. And, and that style, I mean, as a kid in Miami, the posters were mimicking this. Sure. No. The same time period. Well, and I think, you know, that's a good point to take me to the final poster where I want to just show, like, this is, you know, local rock and roll scene, but this becomes the basis for a national movement, right? The ballrooms, the Fillmore and the Avalon become a cultural and a commercial model for things that grow up around the US. You know, Detroit had its grandy ballroom. There was the Fillmore East in New York, which Graham himself oversaw. Um, the Avalon organization also exported what it did to other areas. So the Avalon migrated not quite as far east as New York, but migrated to Denver. Um, so there was an Avalon in San Francisco, and there became an Avalon in Denver, and they were basically like kind of extending their brand, uh, using the same poster artists and many of the same bands who would play between the different venues. Um, so the very last poster on this wall, which is one of my favorites, just in sheerly aesthetic terms, but this is a word Griffin image. And it's for a family dog production in Denver, Colorado. It's Big Brother and the Holding Company and Blue Cheer, right? So we got some repeat offenders, so to speak. Um, so we get a sense here that the San Francisco scene is not happening in a vacuum. And that it's not just that the idea of San Francisco rock is expanding in its influence, but it's actually even the brands that are associated with San Francisco scene are expanding in their influence. But you look closely, you have to come up to this one close if you want to get any sense of what it's about. This is like the best example of how the, I think the underlying aesthetic to the whole scheme of poster art, whatever other influencers are going on, is basically a, a re repurposed sort of pop art, right? Pop art was the movement that tried to break a lot of the boundaries between high and low, between like, you know, the stuff that goes in museums and the stuff that goes in magazines. Um, you know, on some level, the sheer fact that these were artistic creations that were also used as advertisements meant that it was kind of working in almost a kind of pop art vein. But here you get it much more literally with the royal baking soda uh, in the back and the Quaker Oats guy and cream of wheat. There's like all these advertising icons in this image that Rick Griffin's using to advertise this rock and roll show. And then you've also got some things that are more counterculturally coded, like the Grateful Dead skeleton. Um, and to come back to a point that I made earlier, you know, what this I think reveals is the basic underlying eclecticism of the psychedelic aesthetic. That psychedelia as an aesthetic was very much pitched towards not necessarily embracing everything, but breaking a lot of boundaries down that used to be preserved, you know, high and low being among them. Um, but also, you know, it wasn't even just cultural boundaries, but it was like sensory boundaries, right? So you think like, okay, well this was music, so it's really more about the sound, but psychedelic music was also to be seen, not just heard. And I think these posters give us a great vantage point into that, that the psychedelic aesthetic was multi-sensory, that you were supposed to see it and hear it and feel it and maybe even taste it mm -hmm. all at the same time. Um, and that is a very distinct aesthetic purview. You know, it's very different from just portraying the visual as the height of all kind of sensory experience. Um, and I, I think it was that above all that made the psychedelic moment in San Francisco so pivotal because they figured out a way to package all these things in a manner that was very powerful for people. You know, so we're, I haven't even mentioned, for instance, the light shows, which I know many of you know about, but right? I mean, if this is one visual icon that defined a certain ethos that was defined, that was part of this moment. The light shows were actually happening while the shows were going on. And a lot of the aesthetic of these posters was also shaped by those light shows and vice versa. I mean, a lot of the folks who did the light shows would project these images onto the background of the stages when they were doing it. 
Um, so it's that fundamental eclecticism and a kind of multi-sensory experience that was really driving a lot of this forward. Um, I'm going to stop there, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Um, or just leave it to you. <laughs>